Uh, Mr. Vaknin, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, accepting to be a part of the. Uh, Thank you for having me for this interview. Uh, how would you describe the current situation in Israel and uh, all the events in Gaza Strip? Israel is preparing for what Putin likes to call a military, special military operation. <laughs> Israel is uh, preparing to invade uh, part of Gaza, not all of Gaza, but part of Gaza, where the Hamas infrastructure and headquarters are most established, where they have warehouses, where they have naval, naval control, aerial control, where they have a lot of, um, of their commandos. And um, Israel will invade that part of uh, Gaza and will do their best to eradicate or destroy the Hamas uh, infrastructure. But I think we are missing, and when I say we, I mean literally everyone, analysts, everyone, West and East and Arab uh, countries in, in Israel itself. I think we are missing three important points, and maybe it's because we don't like to talk about these points. The first point is that the Israeli army and the Israeli intelligence community are much, much weaker than they were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. I would even be a little extreme and say that the Israeli army and the intelligence community of Israel are paper tigers. They project force and power, but they don't have it. The Israeli army was subjected to severe budget cuts. Consequently, most of the Israeli soldiers are reservists. They go in reserve once, uh, once a year. Their training is very deficient and very low level. They don't know how to operate weapons and so on and so forth. I think the Israeli army today is inferior to the commando of Hezbollah, for example. The commando of Hezbollah is much better trained. So this is a, a very important uh, point. Israeli failures in terms of intelligence and in terms of uh, defensive maneuvers near the Gaza border were not an accident. They reflected a systematic problem. Should Israel be faced with a multi-front problem, for example, should Israel be attacked from the north by Hezbollah, from the south by Hamas, from Syria by the Syrian army, which is backed by Russia and Iran, and internally from the West Bank, and also the Arabs that live in Israel as Israeli citizens, Israel will not survive. Israel does not have the capacity to win a five-front war Israel doesn't have the capacity to win a two-front war. Hezbollah has defeated Israel repeatedly, not once, twice at least. So this is something no one is talking about. Everyone is pretending that Israel has the greatest military, wonderful intelligence. This is a 30-year-old story. The quality of personnel in the Israeli army, the size of the Israeli army. Hamas, um, um, Hezbollah, has as many commandos as the Israeli army, the Radwan Brigade. So this is point number one. Point number two, the United States is not supporting Israel. The United States is trying to control Israel. There's a big difference. The United States is terrified of the crazy criminal government of Benjamin Netanyahu and of the man himself. Benjamin Netanyahu is an indicted criminal with multiple criminal cases in court. Several of his ministers have criminal records. They are all extreme far-right, totally delusional religious people who believe that all, the state, all of Israel should be Jewish and are willing to use power, aggression, and violence to accomplish this. They are closely allied with the settler movement and with other extreme right, essentially militias. So this is a very bad situation. The United States is terrified of what this government might do in terms of civilian casualties, and in terms of provoking other countries, such as Iran, such as Egypt, such as Syria, and Jordan. So the United States is there for damage control, not to support Israel, but to make sure that Israel doesn't misbehave. We can, we can prove this thesis easily. Let us look at the type of weapons that the United States is providing to Israel. The United States recently started an air airlift um, of munitions and weapons to Israel. When we look at these weapons, these are not offensive weapons. They are all defensive weapons and precision munition, munition that doesn't kill civilians. The United States is sending a clear message. Do not kill civilians unnecessarily and do not provoke your neighbors. 
regrettably, that's exactly what Israel is doing. Israel reacted disproportionately to the provocations of Hezbollah. Israel unnecessarily provoked the West Bank, which was totally calm and peaceful after the, unnecessarily provoked the West Bank. Israel is, uh, has attacked Syria because of a single rocket fired from the area of Syria. <laughs> we don't know, Syria is controlled by many factions, you know. So Israel attacked the, the airports and so on in an attempt to sabotage the Iranian minister's arrival. Israel is threatening Iran. Israel is definitely provoking a much bigger war. Israel is now trying to force Egypt to accept 1.1 million people from Gaza as refugees, which Egypt absolutely does not want to do because Egypt regards them as potential terrorists and they, are all, uh, they all represent Iran. They all Shia and Egypt is Sunni. It's the, Egypt doesn't want this and Israel is pressuring Egypt, putting it in an impossible situation. Egypt is Israel's only Arab friend. Israel shares intelligence um, Egypt shares intelligence with Israel. Egypt collaborates with Israel against the Hamas. Egypt blocked the exit to Egypt of Gaza, allowing Israel to impose an effective siege on Gaza. E Egypt is collaborating with Israel. It's a friend. It's an ally. Why? Why to antagonize it and make it into an enemy? I think the United States is there to try to control the situation, not because it's very friendly to Israel or because it wants to help Israel, but it wants, wants to make sure that Israel doesn't go crazy in this situation. And of course, Israel went through a horrible experience and there is a lot of wish for revenge. And, but Israel is a state. Israel is not a terrorist organization. Israel cannot behave this way. It has responsibilities as a state. State terrorism is terrorism, period. And the last point I want to make the greatest internal enemy of Israel is not the Palestinians. The greatest internal enemy are the settlers. The settlers, these are people who came from outside. Most of them are American, actually, Jews. These are people who came from outside. They have totally grandiose, insane concepts that they should uh, own. All the territory of Israel should never give anything to the Palestinians, should even conquer Jordan. They are very aggressive, often very violent. And they invaded the West Bank and surrounded all the major habitations of the Palestinians there with the blessing of the government. Now the settlers are threatening to declare war on the Palestinians in the West Bank. And they are armed. They have militias. They have weapons. Now the Israeli Defense Forces has to, to, to make a war with Hamas. But it also is preparing to make war with the settlers to prevent them from attacking and provoking yet another war in the West Bank. Settlers are the greatest internal enemy of Israel, not Palestinians. Uh, what can we accept, uh, expect uh, to happen in the near future? Uh, what's the possible outcome of the situation? Uh, 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 is this the worst part of the conflict that's lasting for us several decades, or it's uh, going to be peace? This conflict started not for decades. It started in 1882. The conflict between Israelis and Palestinians started in 1882. The, both sides agree on two things, that the other party should be exterminated. <laughs> and the other agreement is that there, the piece of territory, which is currently the state of Israel plus the West Bank plus Gaza, this piece of territory, the size of New Jersey in the United States, is tiny. Both parties want it 100%. They don't agree to give 1% to the other party. They want it 100%. So the demands of the both parties are mutually exclusive, not incompatible. There is no way to negotiate some compromise. There is no compromise. In the Charter of Hamas, one of the main targets is the extermination of the state of Israel. Same with Hezbollah. Hezbollah clearly states that the Jewish state is a transgression against God and it should be destroyed. This is all connected to religion, the Shia strand, strand of Islam. Because in, according to the perceptions of Islam, the Jews, are, and the Christians by the way, people who are not Muslims, they are second class citizens. They are what is known as Ahl al-Dimah. They are second class citizens under the protection of Islam, but never with equal rights to Muslims. 
for someone who is Ahl al dima like the Jews, to make a state is not a transgression against Iran and the Ayatollahs. It's a transgression against God. It's a sin. It's a violation. And the Muslims have an obligation to destroy the Jewish state, to restore the godly order. This is religious, deeply religious. There will be no end to this until one of, the, of these two nations is, I'm sorry to say, ethnically cleansed. There, are, there is no other solution. I think Israel, the steps that Israel is threatening to take in Gaza sound a lot like ethnic cleansing, a lot. They're trying to drive the population completely out, which is, honest, honestly speaking, the only long-term solution. There is no way for a two-way state if you look at the map, there is West Bank, there is Gaza. How to connect these two parts? If you connect these two parts, you break Israel, you fragment it into two pieces. Israel will never accept this. You need to have a corridor between the West Bank and Gaza, which cuts Israel off. Israel will never accept this. And a one-state solution is also not acceptable, where Palestinians and Israel, Israelis will be citizens. It's not acceptable because Palestinians shortly will become majority. So a one-state solution can be either Jewish and not democratic, because the majority of the Palestinians will be in apartheid. Or it can be democratic, but then it will not be Jewish, because the Palestinians are the majority. No way to solve this peacefully. Uh, how the current events affect uh, the safety situation uh, in the region and, uh, and in the whole world, actually. I have, uh, I have little doubt that Israel will enter Gaza, but with a limited military operation. I have equally little doubt that Israel will fail in the military operation, because Gaza, there's a city above and there's a city underground. The city underground, the bunkers, the tunnels, this is not possible to, to clean them, not possible to win this war. Israel has destroyed Hamas four times already. Israel killed all the leaders of Hamas at least twice, all of them. Decapitated Hamas, and it came back again. And if it will not be Hamas, it will be some other organization. You need to tackle the problem, not the symptom. Hamas is a symptom, it's not the disease. The disease is the occupation, the siege. The, the inability of the two peoples to compromise, and th that's a problem. So I think they will enter Gaza. I think there will be a military failure in Gaza, which the Israelis will declare as a victory. And depending what they do to the civilian population, if Israel goes in a revenge, orgy of revenge, and kills tens of thousands of, of, thousands of civilians, Hezbollah will enter the, the war. If Hezbollah enters the war, I think the West Bank will be supportive, and definitely Syria will, will enter the war. At that point, I don't see how the Israeli army and uh, intelligence can win this war, which will force the United States to intervene, to save Israel. Iran is the main uh, sponsor of Hezbollah and Hamas. Iran is the main, so these are long arms of Iran. If the United States intervenes, to help Israel, it can no longer make a deal with Iran regarding nuclear material, regarding frozen money, regarding hostages, and so on and so forth. And Iran becomes a full-fledged enemy and has every incentive to attack directly Saudi Arabia and indirectly Egypt. Yes, this could become a major regional conflagration. If Israel does not attack civilian targets, if it focuses really on Hamas infrastructure and headquarters and rockets, and so on, warehouses, then maybe the situation could be pacified if Israel stops reacting disproportionately to provocations. Hezbollah, for example, at the beginning of the war, the second day, Hezbollah shot two rockets from Lebanon to a tiny area that is disputed between Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. These are known as Shaba farms. It's a farm. And they shot, and it's not populated, and they shot two rockets on a field. That's it. I think it was a symbolic gesture, like saying, my, my Palestinian brothers, we are with you. And I think there Hezbollah would have stopped. 
but Israel reacted with heavy artillery, tanks, uh, <laughs> missiles, destroyed several positions of the, of, the Hama, of the Hezbollah, including the main observation post of Hezbollah on the border. The reaction was super disproportional. And this, of course, forced the Hezbollah to react, not to lose face, not to be ashamed, reputation. So they had to react. So even so, I would say that overall, Hezbollah is much more responsible, much more restrained, and much more in self-control than the Israelis. I have no idea why the Israelis are acting in this suicidal manner. Israelis know very well the bad situation of the army. They know the army will be defeated by Hezbollah. It's not some Vaknin. These are generals online that are saying this. You can go online and see Israeli generals analyzing the, the situations and saying it openly. The army is in bad shape. I have no idea why Israel is playing this extremely dangerous existential game with its own existence, not only future. Perhaps they believe that the Americans will save them when, if push comes to shove. But the Americans have their own interests, their own interests. Will they risk uh, Saudi Arabia for Israel? Will they risk Egypt, which is another major ally for Israel? Egypt is the second most important ally of the United States after Israel. And if you put Egypt and Saudi Arabia, they're much more important than Israel. So will, will um, the United States risk a Shia-Sunni war in the Muslim world where Russia will benefit mightily and will cause Ukraine to lose the war? Because the United States doesn't even have a budget. Budget has not been approved in Congress because of the infighting in the Republican Party. So the United States doesn't even have money to support Ukraine and Israel simultaneously. At some point, the United States will have to decide who, who do we support? Do we support Israel, do we support Ukraine? They will support Israel, of course, not Ukraine. But that would mean a major strategic loss to Russia because they will force Ukraine to negotiate with Russia and to give Russia some territory. So the cost of helping Israel globally, geopolitically, is enormous. And Israel should not take the United States for granted. At some point, maybe the United States will say, well, we, we're going to lose face in Ukraine, and we're going to lose uh, Turkey, and we're going to lose uh, Egypt, and we're going to lose Saudi Arabia. Enough is enough. You know, that's too much. Thank you, Mr. Vaknin, for the interview. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.